Oh, thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful crowd of people, this, this room filled with your warmth, filled with your uh, your joy. The fact that we are people that that um, that are standing here today because of your sovereign will and your your uh, ascribing or imputing your righteousness upon us, not by anything that we've done, but because of what you did. And God, we're even more focused on that in this week, being the, the week prior up to uh, the, the Resurrection Sunday. We were very thoughtful and mindful of what was going on in the first century in 33 AD when you were just, you are set and ready uh, for the stage was set and you did, you, you, you did what you said you were going to do. And that brings us to our, that basis of salvation, which is the origin of our faith. And that is that we believe you at your word. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Oh, guys, yeah, take a look at um, take a look at the questions today, the reflection questions that we're going to go over in a little bit. But guys, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter fourteen. We're going to actually, it's, I'm calling this chapter. Um, we're going to we're going to end up the chapter fourteen, do a little recap, but we're going to call this Acts fifteen a, because we're going to break Acts fifteen up into two sections. So you guys ready to go? Not if you if that means yes. And do this if you're not ready. Okay. Um, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into my map real quick. You guys remember where we're at? I kind of put together this little map uh, <clears throat> that kind of like sums up a little bit more details of like exactly what's going on. Remember, we started off in Antioch and we went to Paphos and Atalia and Antioch. These are the, the very confusing uh, the, uh, arrows, if you will that show Paul's original journey, his very first missionary journey with, with uh, Barnabas. But you guys, this will be in the notes if you guys want to refer to this map later on. But the journey lasted two years, as far as we know. We know This first little missionary journey started and ended in about a two-year span of time. And his first journey, he wrote after this journey that you see in the arrows here, he actually wrote the book we read in the New Testament called Galatians. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. Shortly after attending the, the council in Jerusalem, after he went uh, through this, and we're going to talk about that in chapter 15, you see this where it says Galatia? Galatia wasn't a town. It was a region. A lot of people get this mixed up. Galatia is a region of, of Asia Minor. And so when he writes a book to the, to the church of Galatia, Galatians are the people who live here. But not specifically, not, not to be uh, too specific here, I guess, but he's directly talking about the churches that he started in those specific cities. So that's Galatians. If you guys want to read Galatians, those are the people that he's writing that letter to. The letter to the Galatians is written to the churches of Galatia, which refer to the churches Paul established. And so as the trip concludes, the apostles reach a few more cities, and they don't really get too much opposition. But do you guys remember... Last week, what happened to Paul? What happened to him? He got stoned, and I'm not talking about marijuana. He got totally uh, beat up. He's left for dead. They thought he was dead. They actually thought he was he was dead, and I could picture him like kicking him, you know, but he's not moving, so they thought he was dead. He was not. He was unconscious. And so he, he was revived by his believing friends there, and they took him and probably gave him some chicken noodle soup, and boom, there he goes. He's back in action the next day. He leaves the next day, which I think is miraculous. Picture like a rock, like a boulder hitting your head, knocking you unconscious, probably all over his body, you know, and then getting up the next day and saying, hey, let's keep going. Let's let that sink in for a second. I mean, I don't know if we're, we're too spoiled uh, to, to have that kind of mentality, but Paul was the man. So as we le left last week, Paul had just recovered from this stoning, and he leaves the next day on a trip down to a little old town called Derby. Okay. So got somebody open up their Bibles, Acts 14, 19 through 22. Somebody read that nice and loud so my little microphone can pick it up. I got it. 19 to 22. Yep. <clears throat> but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking that he was dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. And after they had preached the gospel to that city, and had made a good number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, to, to uh, Iconium, and to Antioch. Or two. Oh, strengthening <laughs> the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, 
It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Oh boy. Okay, we got to unpack that. So in Derby, they make they, they make a lot of converts, meaning a lot of a lot of uh, uh, Gentiles place their faith in Christ and the gospel message that they were preaching, and they established yet another Gentile church there in Derby. Now they begin to retrace their steps back through the various churches that they got beat up in. Remember that, which is another interesting uh, concept. The ones that they shook the dust off their feet. Remember, well, they they had these little beachheads of the Gentiles that did give their lives to Jesus when they believed, uh, when they placed their faith in Christ. It started a church in those little bitty towns. And it brought on major persecution inside those towns. So they were going backwards to try to encourage them a little bit. Remember, this is over a two-year span. So from Derby, they head back to Lystra, go back to Iconium, and go back to Antioch. Now, I'd notice this Antioch is not Antioch over in Judea. This is big-time confusion for a lot of Christians. Antioch, Antioch. It's like, it's like us having the word Salem in, in America. There's a lot of Salem, you know. Well, there was a lot of Antiochs back in that day. So from Derby, they go back to those towns. Antioch, uh, this is the different Antioch in modern-day Turkey than the one over in Judea, as I mentioned. And as they reach each church, they bring a message of comfort. By the way, how cool is that to, to make that our goal? Like just a message of comfort. Man, don't we need that? Dude, I mean, lead with comfort, y'all. And as they revisit that, uh, he sums up that this entire thing in verse 22. What's that say at the very end? Somebody's just shouted out. What's 22 say? It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Huh. Wow, that's a different take on Christianity that you hear. Many tribulations will be something that's very unique, and it's the word I'm going to use uniting. I was just talking to my homie here today, Colin. He's been through a lot. He had a spine injury. I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but he had, he's knocking on death's door, man. And he had this kind of moment where he had to wrestle with what is going on? What's this pain all about, right? Well, what's interesting is that his pain and my pain that I've decided that I've gone through my life united us in that conversation. I, I bear witness to that pain. Now, what about your pain? I bet if you would show me a little bit of the tribulations, tell your story, I would bear witness to that. And you would, would bear witness to mine. This is the, the bread and butter of Christianity. That tribulations, Paul, according to Paul, is saying, hey, tribulations is not a mark of wrong. It's a mark of right. So it's the unifying experience of our faith. We must imagine that after Paul and Barnabas left each church, the persecution that fell upon that church had to have been pretty major. And honestly, I'd feel bad, man. Go ahead and set up the table, Nate. Sorry about that, man. <clears throat> and those new believers were probably unprepared for this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, all of a sudden, they're heaped upon death threats and, like, all sorts of bad stuff. And they're not, they don't got the New Testament. They don't got a Christian subculture. They don't got Christian radio encouraging and positive. You know, Kayla, you know, they don't got any of that. And But yet they're supposed to stand in these communities going, no, Jesus, Jesus, like, he really is the Messiah. Don't you get it? No, they're about ready to get their, their butts handed to them and thrown in jail because of it. So it meant, this, this, this is an interesting thing. How many times do you guys do this in your life that when, Things are unhappy in your life. When tribulation comes to knocking at your door, how is how many people oftentimes jump to an incorrect conclusion that says that they're doing something wrong? Like, think about it. I mean, they, they are the common experience of our faith, yet they had to probably rear up a misunderstanding inside of their head. Perhaps it meant that God was unhappy with them and their behaviors. Maybe he needed a little bit more sacrifice. Maybe they needed to give more money. Maybe they needed to get their daughters and sons in line. What is bringing on all this tribulation? Doesn't that sound familiar in our minds? Paul explains that trials and tribulations, brothers and sisters, <laughs> 
are to be expected. Expect it. And no doubt Paul pointed this out in his own experience as proof in the pudding. Let's see. Did Paul have a good time, happy and happy-go-lucky so far? He just got beat up a few times and mocked, thrown out of this couple cities. How, how do you think things are going for old Paul? Well, somebody read chapter 14, verses 23 through 28, y'all. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And then when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Ophelia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Is that in there? Oh, that, that strange literary double negative. Yeah, he's it's a mark of his uh, authorship. It's funny. So on the return ship trip, Paul leaves each church with nobody in charge. Nope. He appointed a leader, appointed an elder. Okay. So Paul appoint, I, I just want to take a little sidebar and tell you about biblical church government. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Well, there's a biblical model for church government that, yes, you guys probably have seen a little bit, but I'm going to guess most of you have not seen in modern Western civilization practiced well. Well, we see a little bit of a glimpse of how to lead a church in this description. You guys remember me talking about the book of Acts not being a book of doctrine. It's not a book of prescription. It's a book of description. Remember me talking about this? This is a travel journal of the first apostles, namely Peter for the first half and Paul for the second half. Well, here's one of maybe three examples where we can literally stand upon a, tr a, a value system or a mandate, if you will, from the pages of Acts as to what do we do as a prescription. This is a good example, namely how to set up a church, how to lead, how to take action and and actually organize human beings in this crazy thing called faith, Christianity. So Paul here is a very interesting piece of the puzzle. He is uh, he appoints an elder, not an electoral college. Can I point that out? <laughs> that he didn't just decide to get a big committee together and let them vote on who's the coolest person in town. You see that? Well, here we have a pecking order, if you will, that Paul appoints them. They were not elected. We'll never see a congregational form of government in Scripture. Did you know that? It's not there. You can try to make it in there. You can try to shove it in there, and you're doing your, doing your eyes to Jesus. But that's not going to be shown in Scripture. The biblical model is always, always, always a process of appointment of men who receive their leadership roles by similar appointment. It's not popular. It's just what's in the pages. The church was always moved forward at the hands of men and women who answered the Spirit's call. And here's a big Christian word, anointing. You know what that means? means just back in the Old Testament, they would choose leaders by dumping olive oil, pure olive oil, over their heads. And that would be a sign of kingship and leadership. God does the same thing in the Spirit. says, hey, right, Nate, i got a call in your life. I need you to step up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you up to another level, and I want you to lead a church, a, a ministry. And Maybe this is prophecy. No, <laughs> the, you, you are being called by God, not by another person, not, be, not as some imaginary thing that you got inspired by by in, through a walk in the woods this is jesus talking leading you to step up into a new calling well the bible never supports the view of non-eldership inside of a church once the work takes hold and let's say neat and they the leadership establishes new leaders inside of that church that he would he would plant and so on and so forth and guys this the bible never supports the view that there is a pope or an utmost 
deity type human here on earth or church leader of any kind. It's not in scripture. Now, there's been entire denominations. There's entire nations that have been adopting, adopted that since the first century, that there has to be an, a human head teacher, a pope, if you will, by the definition of the word, a papery. But there is a chain of anointing and commissioning that's expected through the New Testament and the biblical church governance model. We have what Paul called church fathers, or fathers in the faith. I'm not talking about priests where you call them father. I'm calling what Paul called them fathers in the faith. Now the Catholic Church grabbed onto that term and made it an, an, an integral part of their denomination. But this is the correct this is the correct, I might say, uh, and I'm very confident in this, that he is, he is using the word church father as the one who God used as a tool, as a herald, as the message bringer of the gospel for certain regions. So the believers in Derby calls their father in the faith. It's, there's no more deep meaning to that. He helped introduce them to the gospel. Secondly, I want to point out the first one. It, the, the leaders are appointed. Second one, the elders are plural in each church. You know, like when, when the relevant was, po uh, was born, was planted, it wasn't all about the lead pastor. He had an eldership around him. It wasn't just one elder. It had to start with one elder, but quickly there was two and three and four. And guys, that's biblical. We, we do not have a, a faith or a church, the, the shining light in the end times here, born by one man's genius, one man's leadership skills, his CEO capabilities, if you will. The concept of a single pastor-led model in your churches is not biblical. I'm just saying it's not biblical. Can I do a, yeah, but? There's a big comma here. It doesn't mean that they're illegitimate, though. It doesn't mean that God can't use them he can do whatever he wants, man. I got believers in the Catholic Church. I got people who love Jesus, place their faith in his promises. In uh, I've seen them in the most terrible situations. God is God, and that's just it. Doesn't matter what we do. But what does the Bible say we do? That's all I'm reporting on, is that if the church does not follow this model that's prescribed here, it doesn't mean they're crap. They're done. Should leave. This isn't what it's about. What does the Bible say? It, but I am I am going to say something that I think shepherds should select the sheep, and the sheep should not select the shepherd. And that's what the Bible's showing us. While a new church might rely on a single leader for a time, just like Ephesus did in Timothy and Titus, the church grows. The expectation is that the leaders would be appointed co-leaders. So Titus 1:5 says this, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would be that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city, as I directed you. So finally, Paul and Barnabas commends these new believers to the Lord. Uh, when you think about how hard it was, just for a second, think about this. They they didn't have the internet. Like, no. they, they believe it or not, no cell phones. They didn't have a communication tool over long distances. And then consider the threats and challenges that these churches faced if you even whispered such a crazy notion. But Jesus, that guy that the Romans killed, is our Messiah. Huh. No, New Testament. There's no New Testament. There's no big library that you can go to Jerusalem and read about this Jesus character that they crucified 10 years late, or earlier. There's no, there's no resources. There's no midweek Bible study. There's no maps, you know, <laughs> no support structure for your Christian subculture. Think about that for a second. Man, I mean, being a Christian in some circles is super cool. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hip. They dress a certain way, especially in the worship leader like artist world. Man, you can spot a Christian artist a mile away. They wear the same flannel shirts. They got the cool, uh, you know, the beards and the, you know, they, they hang their guitar really low. I mean, yeah, you got the hats, you know, the weird yellow hats. Uh, 
this is a thing that we experience all the time. And yet, is it on board? Is it on, on par with what Scripture is calling? This is, this is an awesome time to take some inventory of your own life. It was, it, we have to marvel at that, that the church has survived at all. It wasn't just like a Boy Scout club that got snuffed out. Why wasn't it? Like, why didn't it just, like, just completely dissolve? I guess it just has to do with the power of God. And it was upon this truth that Paul rested as well. He was like, this isn't my thing. This is God's thing. The Gentiles are receiving the gospel. He, he, uh, the Paul and Barnabas will be a long way away for many years and must depend on the Lord to take care of all these believers and not them. Guys, I take some serious problem. Like, I take ownership over the people that I lead. And even at, here at the Arts Collective, man, if something bad happens to them, I'm just like, oh, I just want to help and want to rescue and want to, you know. No, man. Sometimes this is, this, is, this is time for you to step back. Now, we transition. We transition into chapter 15 now to learn a, 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 of an earlier challenge to the orthodoxy, there's a big word, of the church. So I want you to ask yourself a question before we dive into chapter 15. What do you do inside of a little church with no internet, <laughs> no resources, no doctrinal beliefs, no New Testament or libraries? What do you do when some harebrained crazy stuff come in? Yeah, air conditioning? No, they didn't even have electricity, Nate. Yeah, believe it or not. What do you do when somebody comes in and says, I don't believe that. I actually think this, and here's why. And it's not the gospel. So what do you do? Well, we're going to find out. Check this out. Chapter 15, verse 1 through 3. Somebody read it. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. All right, so the scene begins in Antioch of Syria, where Paul and Barnabas are still ministering. Okay, so park park yourself right here. Yeah, so sorry, this is yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, this one. Sorry. So where where the men came from Judea and were uh, of this circumcision party. Do you guys remember us talking about Acts eleven? There was this, I think it's Acts eleven. Uh the circumcision party. It's like we got the Republicans, we got the Democrats, and the circumcision party. I mean, this is a political thing by now. Oh, do you believe in circumcision? No. Well, get away from me. You're not a Christian. This is a thing that was boiling up over the last 10 years of Jesus being gone, uh, ascending, and now the church spreading. This party of the circumcision, don't just mull over this as like, oh, well, we don't, you know, there's no big deal today. No, you got to put it into today's context, but not before we learn the context of the day. The men came from Judea and were of this party. These were the same men who had challenged Peter for being willing to enter the home of a Gentile and have supper? Holy moly, how dare you, Peter? Remember, Peter started to cave a little bit. Started saying, hey man, maybe you're right. Like, I could probably still do some of the Judaism stuff. Celebrate Torah, celebrate Yom Kippur, still sacrifice a sheep every year. I mean, why not, right? Well, this same party was saying, Jesus plus, Jesus plus. It's got to have something else other than Jesus, right? Especially since Judaism came from God, right? They came to Antioch of their own initiative because they wanted to snuff this thing out that Paul's talking about. It's an interesting thing. The fact they decided to travel from Judea all the way to Syria to confront Paul's growing missionary ministry to the Gentiles tells you how much this issue had become the issue. It's not just a little little sand, you know, little sandbar issue. This is a mountain. We got to do something about that. That righteous indignation that puffs up your chest. In my personal experience, guys, this acts, this party of the circumcision in Acts 11, 
This is a group of people in my career. Allow me to be personal for a second. I don't like talking about my personal experience too much, but let me just use this as a context. In my personal experience, I've run into this kind of obsessive single-mindedness inside our churches. Let me explain. I met, uh, I meet individuals in small groups all the time through, through my life who define their Christian life and purpose, I might add, of, to them being alive by a single theme or idea. A single theme or an idea. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about? This could be sometimes, this could be hyper-national patriotism. Nationalists, people who view Christianity through that lens. Or, there's many others. Uh, or, here's the Gentiles we see in today, in the Bible here, trying to mimic or adopt Jewish practices and lifestyle. They're not Jewish. And they're, they're practicing Judaism. We have that today, guys. There's movements all across the internet, YouTube channels. Oh, man, they're making millions off of going back to the original law. Did you know that? It's sweeping across the nation right now. Going back to our roots. It's called the Roots Movement. One of the, one of the movements. There's a thousand of them. But they think Christianity through the lens of the Old Testament. Okay? There's a third one. What about natural remedies and healthy lifestyles and 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 uh and healthy eating viewing christianity yeah exactly you got it you got these people that are going hey yeah cool christianity cool yeah whatever man but like this you know this thing or there might be a different fad per week you know depends on what the culture is doing like i can just see i can just look in the rearview mirror of the last four years and wow what a what a crazy journey we've been on racial reconciliation uh, LGBTQ, social justice, and inside of the Pentecostal charismatic churches, tongues. Like, is tongues a big deal? You know, there's these factions of people who go, oh, is, is this a spiritual gift? Or should I, should I try to fix everybody's hunger? You know, should I meet the needs of the community? Guys, there's a theme for every day. So here's, here's what Paul is up against. Circumcision was a big deal. And it had to be addressed because you cannot be a proper Christian unless you believe this. Does that sound familiar? You can't be X without prescribing to this party. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm an independent. I lean this way. I lean, you we guys, we see it all the time. So what's the Bible trying to tell us right now? The problem with these narrow focuses is the way it creates selective attention. Selective attention that leads to group of men and women going up to Syria trying to make a point with torches, you know, with pitchforks. When we adopt a thing, I'm putting that in air quotes, we see everything through that lens, you know, like God created you like this, created you like this. Thank goodness. Uh, I mean, I, they do make glasses because now I can, I can see you guys are all foggy, but when you have a thing, it's like putting on that thing on your face, and everybody has that tinge. Everything becomes a little bit more about that lens that you're looking through. And these group of people were frothed up, as they say. So Alistair Begg, I don't know if you guys listened to him, but he tells a really funny story of an American pastor who came up and asked him, totally legit, after an a, a evangelism thing, so what's your thing? And he goes, excuse me? Yeah, like, what's your thing, man? And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. He was actually asking him, what party are you a part of? You see? And in, in Christianity, we have parties all over the place. You know, we have, we, we have everything under the sun. And I'm asking you to take inventory of our focus today. How it leads to an unbalanced or uneven chance to mature, to mature, or even a failure to mature. Are these people non-believers? Are they going to hell? Are they the terrible people? No, 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 no. It just impedes the maturing process that God has in store for them. That's it. So you will only attend if you're up these things. Tell me, tell me if this is true. This is my last little personal note, is I cannot... I cannot have, they will not tolerate 
such things other than the thing. Does that make sense? So you can't you can't keep their attention. And a lot of times I'm not making fun of anybody. It's just that they're 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 a thought of of scripture and their thought of the entire narrative is is uh is short. It's it's shallow. It's all this thing, this one single thing. And I just I just want to kind of throw this out there as like a, an attention for you guys, because they will only attend certain things that the topic of interest and ignore the important areas of Christian growth. More troubling to me, the narrow focus can lead in extreme cases to a warped theology and a false gospel. It's not coming from the Bible. It's just made up by humans. This happens here. This happens now. The desire to cherish long-standing Jewish mandates led to an expect expectation that Gentiles need to do that too. You see that? It's cherished to us. It's tradition. And you know what? You're not going to cross this line unless you prove to me that you've done X, Y, and Z. Does that sound like a Christian, like a religion to you? It sounds like the religion to me that I've been a part of my whole life. And to force this outcome. These men teach that God himself has made it a requirement for acceptance in heaven. you got to gotta be circumcised, y'all. All you ladies out there, I'm sorry, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> but this is a, a, a piece of history that's even in, in non-canon uh, 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 sources. In other words, a work was required. Listen to me for a second. It's a gospel that says a work is required. You got to do something. You got to act a certain way. The same problem was also happening in other Gentile churches. While in Antioch, the problem is circumcision. In Galatia, it was the law as a whole. They were still doing everything. They were like, well, cool, Jesus. Cool, but we're going to keep doing all the festivals and all of the Old Testament covenant because Jesus really didn't like make that disappear, did he? We still got to, we got to put an extra effort in to get ourselves into heaven. Men were teaching that keeping the law was required for salvation, which is why Paul wrote the letter to Galatia to debunk that. While in Antioch, he did that. Listen to Paul's opening words in this letter. I'm going to just read it. Check this out. Paul, an apostle, he wrote that. By the way, I'm an apostle. Just remember, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Christ Jesus and God, the God and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That's a pretty cool way to start a letter. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of the, our God the Father, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting. Deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel you are? Which is really not another at all. It's not a gospel. That's interesting that he said that. You, you, left, you left the gospel for a gospel that's not a gospel. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So look at this. When these men reach Antioch, Paul and Barnabas confront these men, and they are strongly resisted during this teaching. And they debate these men at length. The word of dissension in that verse means uh, strife. Yeah, super strifeful in Greek. The unity of Antioch that Luke describes earlier is now threatened by wrong teaching. Wrong teaching, wrong teaching is a big deal. Knowing Paul's ability and track record for debating false teaching and snuffing it out kind of surprises me that he just didn't shut them down right there. You notice that? They kind of almost like win. But for the benefit of the church as a whole, God causes the argument to simmer a little bit longer. The church leaders decide that the issue should be resolved by a meeting in Jerusalem with the apostles as a whole. Why do you suppose they did that? Remember that Peter has the keys to the kingdom. Peter. And he's in Jerusalem. And he had the power to bind and loose on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not making this up. This refers to the power to permit or forbid certain practices or beliefs for the purpose of setting church doctrine in practice. 
The decision must move to Jerusalem for the apostles can meet and include Peter for the final decision. They're like, hey, you know what? We're never going to win this deal. We got to go to the president. Let's let's just bring this to let's bring this up to old uh, uh, Joe Biden. Let's let old old Joe decide. We're not going to settle this out in court. We got to settle it out with the with the main guy. So let's go. So they send Paul, Barnabas, and other men. Uh, by the way, you, we know that Titus went with them. And we can assume that some representatives to the other point of view attended that meeting as well. It's notably noteworthy that the leaders in this church do not include Paul and Barnabas' names. Did you see that? That Paul and Barnabas weren't listed as church leaders. They submit themselves to the authority of the elders they put in place. Whoa, that's so cool. To me, that's so cool. What a demonstration of submission to authority Paul and Barnabas demonstrates there. I wish I saw more of that. And they are founding members of the church, you know, and apostles. They could have been like, you know what? I started this thing. I'm going to tell you what's going on. They might have demanded the elders kick out the troublemakers and simply accept the apostles' word and get with the program. There's the door. Instead, they didn't do that. They follow the instructions of the elders. The elders felt that it was best for them to go to Jerusalem. Since they have to take the long journey through uh, Phoenicia and Galatia and Galilee and Samaria, the apostles take the opportunity to inform all the churches there what's happening among the Gentiles. And guess what? They were encouraged. They were greatly encouraged to hear that the Gentiles were joining the church. But as they progressed to Jerusalem, Paul would have encountered more and more Jewish people to be churched, people of the Jewish faith that were, would be hearing the gospel for the first time. And they probably reacted indifferently to the news. And it must have concerned and excited the young Jewish church, though it was a sign of the power of the gospel. What I mean by that is, if you guys ever, to, to me, there's nothing more exciting than to hear testimony of God moving. You know what I mean? Like if some somebody's got a story about how God moved in their life and, and totally taught them this lesson and provided for their family, man, that is like gold. I'm even more moved when I, when I hear about a testimony of going through pain. And it brought the Jews comfort to know that they were not alone. I guess that's that unifying glue, that it's nice to know that, you know, my brother Colin, he's not alone. I'm not alone. We're unified. So they instead they were be they were beginning to join by the world of the Gentiles into faith. Yet it brought concerns to everybody. What would happen to the Jewish culture within the early church? Is it are, are we gonna are we gonna get rid of the festivals? I love that matzah bread. I just can't get enough of it. Would the Jewish church become overwhelmed by Gentiles? Where are we gonna put all these people? Our churches don't have enough facility for this. What about our bathrooms? Yeah. You know, <laughs> the toilet paper is going to have to be a budget budget item in, in the paint colors and the carpet. You know, who's going to organize the pancake feed? This is likely at the core of why the party of the circumcision was trying to convert Gentiles to Judaism first. They were saying, become one of us. It's easier. We don't need what we don't need any of your weird ideas. And, as, and, and out of fear, they were trying to stop the inevitable. They were resisting God's desire to create a Gentile bride for Christ. And by the way, if you're a believer listening to me, you placed your faith in Christ, you are because of this. Acts 15, 4 and 5 says this. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God has done with them. But some of the secret the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the entire law of Moses. After, so after giving their initial report and the rapid growth of the church among the Gentiles, certain men stood up and said, hey, I got something to say. And this sect of Pharisees, which refers to the party of the circumcision from Acts 11-2, are these people. And they demand both circumcision and following the law. Holy moly, good luck with that. It makes sense that the Pharisees would expect submission to the law since they themselves defined themselves by the scrupulous following of that law. 
This is an example of narrow focus that, that just lends on a single theme of Christian living. This is what we do. And in this case, the theme wasn't a Christian theme at all. Did you know Judaism is not Christianity? I don't want to wreck your world there, but this is a very interesting thing to study. Hebrews, uh, taught, Romans, Paul lays out an amazing dichotomy of paganism, nomianism, and Judaism, all in the same camp of not Christianity. It's an unchristian theme that distorts the gospel that Jesus fulfilled the law, guys. He said, I did and have done and did once and for all, no longer a need to do. In chapter 2 of this letter of Galatia, Paul describes how this meeting began. He arrived with Barnabas and Titus, right? And he immediately met, meets with Peter, James, and John to see how they felt about the matter. Hey, off the record, what are you thinking about this stuff? Paul says he submitted to them the story of how he preached the gospel to the Gentiles. When Paul says how he means in that, not merely that the Gentiles were receiving the gospel that wasn't news to anybody. Rather, he means of how he preached faith without works was the means to salvation. <laughs> I mean, Paul wanted to find out if Peter and the rest of the apostles were preaching the same gospel. Like, am I all alone here? Like, I thought, I thought Jesus totally fulfilled all of that. Am I, am I on the same page? Paul private, Paul's private meeting results in the apostles agreeing that this is the true gospel, and they plain plan to see uh, in secret for how they will conduct a public meeting with the Gentiles. And that meeting takes place. Somebody read 15, 6 through 11, please. Anybody? 6 through 11. There you go. Much discussion. Peter got up and addressed his brothers. You know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through grace, uh, through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Awesome, man. Luke says in a meeting it's held to consider the demands of the Pharisees. Luke indicates in verse 7 that there's got to, there's no lie that this is hotly debated, but the debate wasn't among the apostles. Guys, we're unified on this deal. You guys aren't. It was among the Gentiles and the elders and the Pharisees. That's where the dissension was coming from. According to Galatians 2, the apostles had already met and agreed upon the course of action, and the apostles observed and listened to the whole proceeding. They didn't even need to. They were just like, we'll hear you out. No problem. By allowing the room to voice opinions first, the apostles gained a useful advantage. Can I point a couple of those out? They learned, number one, who among the prominent men of the church understand the gospel properly and who do not. Isn't that crazy? Secondly, they give the body of believers a chance to feel a part of the process and help cement their acceptance to the apostles decree include people in on it. this isn't a, a, a higher this isn't a, a tyrannical communism where the big cheese at, at the top decides and they put the smack down no they include people it's not an election remember that but they include the body to be a part of the process peter speaks for the first time i'm sorry for the last time in the book of Acts. Did you see that? Peter spoke. That's the last time you're going to hear him speak in the book of Acts. We don't really know what happened to him. We know that he was martyred, but he never entered in the canon of Scripture after this point. So we better listen. Peter begins by reminding the crowd that it was God himself who made the choice over 10 years earlier to include the Gentiles in the church. Remember Cornelius? 
the circumstances of that Cornelius salvation made clear to everyone, and it was pretty famous by now, that it's just plain as the nose on your face that the Gentiles, not just the Jews, get to be grafted into the plan of the gospel, the salvation message of Jesus Christ. So, and, and that choice was made clearest by the fact that God visibly gave Gentiles the same spirit that lives in us now, the Holy Spirit. Here again, we see the unique significance for God making the arrival of the Holy Spirit such a big deal. It's three times, remember that? The visible indwelling. It was a watershed moment when Gentiles believed, and God made sure everyone in the world would know about it, that the Spirit had arrived. Peter goes on to point out the arrival of the Spirit resulted in a cleansing that was universal, hear this out, and common to both Jews and Gentiles. What's the cleansing I'm talking about? Peter makes his turn with one of the most powerful statements against legalism. You guys ever, you ever hear the word legalism? It's nomianism. Basically, it's this idea that we can figure out rules and regulations to live by. And when we do, we produce good results. And that's, the, that's called nomianism, rule following. Legalism is actually imposing someone else to do those rules. Like, I might believe it, but now I want, I want Mike to do it. And I want Steve to do it. Legalism. I was raised uh, in a very uh, 80s and 90s Christianity era where my, my dad and mom were just trying to raise me the best they can. And sometimes we, we as children, experienced legalism. Now, I, I don't know where you guys grew up, but in a Christian home, man, we got rules to follow, right? Rules. Well, legalism is the imposing of those rules heavily. First, he says, why do they test God? You see that? Why do you test God? Why did he say that? Well, the word test here means that to doubt the Gentiles' entrance into the church on the basis of faith alone would be to call into question God's judgment. You see that? He's basically saying to God, are you sure you want these wahoos in the club? Since God himself had made clear that his intent to include Gentiles on the same terms, he included the Jews. Boom. It's the proof. When the Pharisees asked Gentiles to do more than God required, they are testing God. Ooh. So secondly, Peter compares the demand of the Pharisees as a yoke on the neck of the disciples. Like they're just putting big yoke, you know, those oxen yokes, shoving those over these Christians saying, you need to do that and this, and that. Notice that Peter uses the word disciple to refer to the Gentiles. Oh, that's inflammatory. Hmm. And he sees the requirement levied by the Pharisees as a yoke. We're going to levy these, these requirements on you. That's a yoke. And Peter adds that not even the religious observant Jew was capable of bearing this yoke that they want them to carry. It's just not possible. According to the Jewish law, by the way, if you get circumcised, if you were a Pharisee, if you were uh, a, a, the Pharisee of Pharisees, as soon as you flipped off the guy in the camel next, you know, on their way to work, you've, you've, you've condemned yourself to hell. I mean, this is the Old Testament we're talking about. This is impossible. God did this on purpose to implore and imply and point forward a Messiah that would undo the condemnation of the law. So Peter correctly states that no one keeps the law. Isn't that interesting? Like, wow, so you, you, got this, you got this extra thing going on. Do you do that? No, they do not. Not the fathers and not us. Abraham didn't even. I mean, Moses didn't keep the law. So why think the Gentiles, a bunch of these Gentile peeps, could do this either? Peter correctly states that salvation is by grace, by the grace that God gives alone. There isn't, there isn't a comma. It's by the grace of God that you're saved. It isn't, it's the grace of God and a bunch of other stuff. Grace means that God doesn't recognize merit or achievement. I'm sorry to say, He doesn't look at anything that you've done as a merit or achievement to salvation. Oh man, that has nothing to do with it. So let off a little bit. He grants a pardon 
for his own purposes. Do you know that? That you're a believer for his purpose? That should lighten your load a little bit. If you're in rebellion against God, man, I'd love to talk to you because like, if that's like the only thing holding you up, man, there's freedom. There's freedom behind that of knowing that God's got a purpose for you. Like you, even you, with all of your garbage that you carry around in a backpack all day long. Nate, <laughs> when we ask someone to perform a work, you guys ever done that? We're asking all these people to be like Christians out there in the world, and it's weird. You can't expect that. Yeah. You can't perform a work as a part of your salvation that we ourselves are not even able to perform adequately. And in this case, the sin is made worse because the Pharisees' instance, insistence that this work is a requirement for salvation. Holy moly. Man, that's, that's a heavy, heavy, tall order. Imagine how much damage we've done in the early church, how much would have been done if the Pharisees' view had prevailed. Can you imagine what it would look like? Imagine how much damage would be done. How many Gentiles would have found the gospel to be good news at that point? Isn't that what the gospel means? Good news? If it's including a requirement to be circumcised and then perform the law. They, by the way, they were drinking blood. You know, they were uh, killing, uh, you know, they were worshiping insects and salamanders. And they were uh, giving, they were sacrificing their children on a, on a, on a, a, uh, a hot plate uh, as an infant for fertility to the god Moloch. You know, they just came from that to now this. You guys, these Gentiles, you got to know the context of these Roman Gentiles in the diaspora. They were totally not into this. They were doing something completely different. They're worshiping Diana. They were going to the, uh, the, uh, the Pantheon. They had like 160 gods. I mean, <laughs> They had all these rules and regulations. Now the Pharisees say, okay, cool. Throw that all away. Now, just replace it with this. So legalism is what they were talking about. And I'm almost done right here. Legalism is a uh, easily overlooked thing in our evangelistic patterns. Paul's saying, look out. Peter's saying, that's not the gospel. We should preach and teach salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone and nothing more. That's it. You don't got to be you don't got to be clean. You don't got to be all put together. Holy smokes, why are we doing that to people? Any discussion of godly living and standard of conduct are premature and inappropriate for anyone who is considering the truth of the gospel. So why do we throw it at people? Why do we do that? And for those who had believed, any discussion of behavior must be divorced from the conversation of whether or not they're saved. It's not a salvitic issue. That's sanctification. That's maturity. It has nothing to do with your salvation. This is post-faith. Here, man, we, we, we are missing it. We're, we want to put sanctification in front. Let's say if you could dot all these I's, maybe we'll let you into our organization. That's not the way the gospel works. And for those uh, who are saved by grace alone, they're, they're saved and done so through faith alone. What is the essence? What's the origin of faith? Do you guys remember me talking about this all the time? Maybe I haven't. Maybe I just dreamed this up. What is faith? What's, what is faith? <laughs> it's the craziest F word ever, right? Faith is the F word uh, to remember. Yeah. Faith is the evidence of things unseen, right? It goes deeper than that. It's actually believing what God said he's going to do. Right. That's it. That's it. That's what ascribed righteousness to Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Adam. We talk about Adam. That's it. There's no circumcision. There's no sacrificing. There's no anything. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth to be the perfect law of Bidur. And he did so once and for all to pay off exactly what you owed the Creator, God. You didn't do anything. He just did it for you. They are, now we, and those people that we're talking about now, saved by grace alone through faith alone. 
Behaviors are simply not a part of the conversation. They're not. I know they're offensive. I mean, I know when my, my teenage kid comes home and he's got a new language, he's got a new habit, new addiction, new substance in his life, whatever. I don't even want to know sometimes because it wrecks my heart. Like it, it makes me spin out and I have to be on medication and because it's so offensive and my heart palpitations, you know, didn't have those until I had kids. It's, it's because of this. I have to remember the day where Christ came and, and I remember my sons placing their faith in Christ, not at a church. It wasn't at an altar. It wasn't at a summer camp where everybody's hyped up. That's cool. Super cool. God can use it. They decided, they decided that it made sense. It was God that saved them, and they responded in faith. They responded by saying, in their little childish mind, it made sense that God, you do, and you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And he gave us a down payment with Jesus. Even greater than that, he indwells us now, if you're a believer, with the Holy Spirit, according to Paul and Romans, it's all over the New Testament, you are now given the Spirit of God. You are the temple. No longer needing to bring lambs and sacrifices to the temple. You are the temple of God, and the body of Christ just keeps growing and growing despite how many times we try to snuff it out. That's right. Jesus is the high priest, man. Yeah, that's it. You guys, thank you so much for listening. I wanted to go back to this real quick and check out these reflection questions, and I'm going to stop and... Uh, and let you guys simmer on these a little bit. But number one, if my faith causes tribulations in my life, do I dump? Do I dump? Do I jump to conclude that there is something wrong with my behaviors? That's a hard one, man. For me, man, I'm like, why is all this bad stuff happening to me? That's that's normal. It's supposed to be normal. Number two, do bad things happen to only bad people? Boy, that's an interesting thing. Nope, it doesn't. Nope. Am I overlooking areas of legalism in my evangelistic patterns? Man, I got to check my heart on that one, you know? Do I define my Christian life and purpose by a single theme or idea? I mean, guys, I, I, I'm an artist, you know, musician, singer-songwriter guy. I used to worship music. I used to, like, bow down to it, live, breathe, drink. I told my wife, if I wouldn't have met Jesus and her... <laughs> I would be steeping, brooding over my poetry somewhere in my basement, never seeing the light of day, because I just would be so infused with this worldview. Man, I, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just Jesus plus. I was taking something and I was shoving it in front of Jesus going, hey, I kind of like this more than you, so I'm going to keep you in my back pocket, but I'm going to do my thing. Hopefully that's cool. And <laughs> is, that, is that going on in your life? And last but not least, am I testing God in my life by the way I live? Saying to, saying to him by being legalistic is like saying that he doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't really quite get what he needs to do. So I'm going to help God out a little bit. You know, we sit upon thrones of judgment, you know, in our own, informed by our own devices of self-preservation and experience. And how limited of, of a span of life do we have to be able to make eternal calls and just, judgments over people's souls? Think about how silly that is. Guys, let's pray. Thank you for this wonderful time of, of like listening to uh, me yak and speak and teach. Lord, I just ask that you take everything I said. Humbly, I submit it to you and allow them to hear exactly what you wanted to hear and reject all the stuff that's not from you. Thank you for this, this crew of people who were curious about these things still. It's not, uh, it's, it's still alive. And I am so encouraged by that, my faith. Because we really do. We believe. Not just believe in a, in a character that came 2,000 years ago on Easter and raised from the dead. We don't just believe that it happened. We believe that you are going to do, based upon what we know and read in your truth, that you're a God who keeps promises, period. In the story, my dad used to say, you could take to the bank. And Lord, I just take this to the bank. This is true. This is the, the one thing I can bank on. We, we, I just pray a prayer blessing over all these people. In Jesus' name, amen.